And we are live again um, for almost the last talk of the day. If you were sticking around from the previous session, I said we had the closing keynote left. Um, I kind of got carried away. I missed it by one. We have one more talk today, um, which I will introduce in just a moment. But we do want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Um, INE eLearn Security, of course, Axonius, Google, uh, We Hack Purple, Juniper Networks, MongoDB, uh, CoreLight, and of course, Bridgeview. Thank you all. We couldn't do this without you. Um, you've been doing an amazing job supporting all of Diana Initiative. And I also want to throw out a quick thank you to all of the staff of Diana Initiative, the volunteers, and everyone that has really been pulling this all together. So thank you all to um, everybody involved for making it happen. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Megan DeWitt. She's going to be up for our next talk, which is protecting the source of our spark. I'm really looking forward to this because it has a lot to do with ICS and OT type systems. Um, very interesting um, to look forward to. I do want to introduce with one other little friend of mine. This is Oscar, Oscar the Unicorn. And Oscar will say, let's get this talk started. Take it away, Megan. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to my presentation this evening or afternoon. Uh, is everyone seeing my screen? I am getting community. Oh, there we go. It looks like we are good to go. All right, and with that in mind, let's continue. Okay, so a little bit about me and my notes. So as a career profile, I am a senior consultant at Security Risk Advisors. My security vocation is I started as a security and compliance man uh, project manager at a, an accounts receivables firm, and I, um, I was not quite sure if I wanted to do cybersecurity at the time, uh, but at this, at, at when I uh, there was a, a an attack in Paris, uh, I'm getting some feedback from everyone. Is everyone able to see my screen? Maybe not. Um, okay. We having some technological issues. Give me just a second. Let me talk to my MC. All right, and with that in mind, looks like we are good to go. Anyway, so, <laughs> okay, awesome. I'm getting some information from Kat. Looks like I'm good. All right, so my security vocation began as a security and compliance manager at an accounts receivables firm. I learned to love security from the fact that um, a terrorist attack actually occurred in Paris in 2015. Uh, it was later found out that the attack was completely coordinated through PlayStation 4 communications, which was just mind boggling to me. Uh, and that's when my love for security kind of solidified. I determined that I wanted to do everything that I could possibly do to protect my family and friends via the web. Uh, a fun fact about me, by the way, is that I am completely and totally obsessed with Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I still watch it multiple times throughout the year. Uh, I am recently a mom to a six month old baby, as you can see from the slide. I got married and moved states, bought a home and got my practice child dog, who you see in a, a very poor picture. You can see all of the, the objects that I was currently moving at the time. But this is my little family. My hobbies include keeping all of them alive, <laughs> meditating and trying to find the, find the Zen, and sleeping whenever I can. So we're gonna go through how ICS and OT security impacts your life on a daily basis. Because I have a feeling that most of you are not quite sure what it is and how it does. We'll review the current landscape so the, uh, with the news. So I'll go back as far as 2010, but we should, I want you to keep in mind that a lot of these attacks were occurring as early as the early of 20th century. 
We'll go through some system components where they're identified within the Purdue model framework, what their purpose is, and what industry you can find them in. The technological differences between IT and OT as well. Risk management that it's currently affiliated with OT devices and how they differ from IT. I'll provide some solutions and how to get started. And from there, I'll give you some continuous learning and development activities. All right, there are 16 critical infrastructure components, some of which could be energy, pharmaceutical research and development, manufacturing, transportation, smart cities, uh, government defenses, energy, nuclear production, transportation via, well, Navy here, and then also medical devices. And with that in mind, critical infrastructure is defined as infrastructure that would have debilitating consequences without um, debilitating consequences for physical and logical assets. All right, give me just a second. All right. Oh, sorry, there was just a little bit of lag. Looks like I'm having some construction in the area, but we move on. So that was the cybersecurity infrastructure security de um, definition of critical infrastructure. So from manufacturing plants to medical labs to our power grid, they all represent critical infrastructure that can be exploited to cause unimaginable consequences. So consider the statistic for a second. There are currently more connected devices than there are people in this world, which is just mind boggling to me. And recently there's been a trend to incorporate internet of things devices into the industrial sector which is coined as industrial IoT. And some examples of IIoT devices can be HVAC systems, smart meters, logistics and tracking, remote monitors and medical equipment. So some examples I'd like to run through are uh, remote heart surgery and smart traffic lights. The, pur the purpose of remote heart surgery technology is to redefine healthcare by providing superior services from specialized physicians, wherever they may be. There are several components to this and why it's beneficial to society. One of them is that we don't really have enough skilled workers that can complete this kind of surgery. So we don't want it to, we don't want location to be a factor to everyone's healthcare. A specialized physician, like I mentioned, can be called upon at any time during an emergency if there is a remote program. And the amount of money that can be saved not transporting that physician, if it is a scheduled heart surgery, which sometimes they may not be, is very beneficial to the overall cost and can help the associate and the medical affairs. So some issues with this is that there could be dire consequences if it is interrupted technology. It could be brought offline for numerous reasons. The reasons I'm going to talk to you about include cyber attack. So this could mean someone's life if the remote heart program has been brought down. Now, I'm not a medical <laughs> professional whatsoever, so I'm sure there has to be some sort of backup here. Um, if the physician, the remote physician is lost, I'm sure there is a physician that could take over. Whatever that may be, it's a situation no one wants to be in. Another example I like to use is smart cities which are contributing to the overall safety and well-being of the residents by deploying emergency vehicles and providing real-time communications to ensure traffic signals are synchronized to help decrease the time spent on the road. I think most of us have either been that person or seen a person who is trying to frantically get out of the way of an emergency vehicle. Well, smart cities are here and have cameras and lights to inform you when an emergency vehicle is at hand and when they're nearby, so that you're not that person in the middle of the intersection getting in the way of them. So, these are great things and can really help our community and the health and well being. But exploitation of this infrastructure can cause power outages, shortages in smart vehicles, interrupt manufacturing lines, and a million other possibilities, which could overall affect our daily lives. So let's imagine for a second an example that has been really close to home for all of us over the past year and a half. 
the coronavirus. You're probably asking, how does cybersecurity impact the coronavirus? Well, most R&D labs utilize a large amount of industrial IoT. If manufacturing line has been disrupted because of a cyber attack, then that means fewer dosages made, more time to distribute, and since every minute, hour, and day can mean a huge difference for those in critical condition from COVID, it's monumental. What if the labs in quality control are impacted by a cyber attack? This means that the dosages can't be tested, due diligence can't be completed, and without confirmation that those dosages meet the safety requirements, the dosages can't be distributed. And again, we're running into the scenario where we aren't distributing the dosages fast enough. Another scenario is if logistics and tracking system is brought down by a cyber attack. How are, the, how are the distributors or the transportation teams supposed to know who gets what dosages and how many when they're projected to arrive? And that, so to summarize, there could be a lot of different scenarios when something could go very wrong throughout the development and delivery of any vaccines. People generally don't think that cybersecurity impacts everyone like other career choices, but those people are wrong. All folks in cybersecurity directly impact the health, safety, and happiness of a lot of different people and communities throughout their work. It is unfortunate, however, that uh, cybersecurity isn't a job where you hear about good things happening on the news. <laughs> For example, cybersecurity experts don't necessarily get limelight like we might deserve when things are going well, but rest assured, those within the security community recognize the long hours and the sacrifice you put in. So, like I mentioned earlier, there has technically been ICS OT cyber attacks since the early 1900s. However, with the increase in internet connected devices, the threat landscape has grown exponentially. With that, I'm going to activate our first poll. I'm going to send it via chat. Let's see, Kat, what would be the best way to send it in chat here? Um, we might not be able to do this. I think I'm a little bit technologically challenged. But either way, we'll go back. The poll is... Can you guess the percentage change in ICS OT cyber attacks between 2018 and 2019? Uh, it's a little bit of an astrological number at 2,000% increase from 2018 to 2019. A recent study was conducted with 150 individuals involved in security strategy within the manufacturing space and slightly over half of the people so that their sites are definitely vulnerable to cyber attacks. Of course, the reasons for this weren't outlined since it basically be giving the hackers keys to their kingdom, but there could be numerous possibilities, some of which could be uh, faulty network segmentation, legacy operating systems not able to be patched, and access control. Tenable Vice President of OT Security, Marty Edwards, mentioned that they are seeing two common paths for OT exploitation. One being direct internet connectivity, and two, phishing attacks that are targeted at enterprise network. Megan, I'm gonna interrupt you really quick, just for a okay. second. In the comments section on the right-hand side, that's yeah. where you can post the polls that oh. you wanna do. Fabulous, okay. okay. Well, thank you, Kat. I appreciate you. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, I won't Sorry have everyone. No. Sorry. Keep going. I won't have everyone miss out on the next one then, because that it they're they can be good. <laughs> okay. Uh. So, not only do oh here we go back to it. So the recent attack vectors include enterprise access and phishing attacks because you would be shocked to see that a lot of enterprise and OT manufacturing networks share the same physical connection. So once a, an attacker gets into the enterprise network, the chance of lateral movement being able to happen and to get access or some sort of control into the manufacturing network is not that complicated. So not only do we have that, we also have 
um, interesting amount. Uh, we also have a labor shortage at this point. So with this in mind, 58% of companies are struggling to find someone with both experience in manufacturing and production. I've gone through a lot of trends so far before I move on. I do have this posted, so if you are like me and you want to nerd out at your leisure and go through all of these articles, I'll have them posted at the end just to let you know. So some of you are probably wondering, the anticipation might be killing you, um, what is SolarWinds, Triton, Stuxnet, and Havocs doing here and why haven't I mentioned them? Well, we're getting into it. So solar winds is top of mind. We'll start with that. This attack may not have been targeted specifically at ICS OT infrastructure, but it did manage to impact the energy sector, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Treasury Department, all in one foul swoop. According to the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, NERC, which is a mouthful, 25% of power utilities were exposed via the solar winds attack. However, there is little information out there right now about how much impact occurred within the ICS OT technology in the power plants. There's still a lot of information being gathered to see exactly how much damage the attack occurred, happened upon since it did occur just a couple of months ago. Um, and since it did occur very soon, I encourage you to stay up to date on following the news headlines. If you have my memory, you might need some more information and for me to jog your memory on the other attacks listed here. So Stuxnet is identified as the first advanced persistent attack targeted specifically at ICS OT infrastructure at an Iranian nuclear facility. The worm completely altered the, co altered the code at the nuclear facility, which in turn destroyed the plant centrifuges, causing them to burn out. Eventually, the worm was modified and targeted to other sectors, including water treatment plants, power, and oil and gas. So I want to say this is the fun part, but I know it's not. The attack was spread via a USB drive to Windows machines. So in my head, I have this visage of uh, an employee in the parking lot seeing a USB drive in the parking lot on the ground thinking, I wonder what's on this USB drive. Let's put it into my computer to see what happens. And then they run and execute. I have no idea if this actually happened, but this is the story I like to tell myself. The developers of Stuxnet reportedly programmed the worm to expire in June of 2012, and the vendor corrected the PLC issue that led to this flaw. But the legacy of Stuxnet lives on to this day with other attacks using its source code. Triton attack which was targeted at safety instrumented systems where it deployed the malicious code to reprogram these controllers. So the result of this incident was the sys controllers triggered a shutdown. An important thing for you to know here, I will go over the, what a sys controller is, but it is directly in related to someone's overall safety within a power plant manufacturing, basically any ICS OT infrastructure. So, the result of this attack made a safe shutdown occur, but the entire manufacturing process was halted because of that, hindering productivity while the investigation occurred. Havocs, it's a remote access Trojan or a RAT. And for those of you who don't know what a RAT is, it's a program that includes a backdoor for administrative control. The backdoor is very easily hidden in legitimate software and if this is the case, and in this case, it occurred from an infected vendor website. The Havocs rat utilized a common ICS communication protocol called OPC for reconnaissance and data exfiltration. So all of these attacks directly or indirectly targeted ICS OT systems. I mean, take a look at a handful of the attacks that are making the headlines in 2021 alone. There is more here. Um, there is a ferry attack on the East Coast for the transportation system. There was the JBS. I had to stop editing this slide because it became too much for me to keep up with. So I encourage you to stay in the news and the headlines to see what's going on within the industry. 
Okay, now that we know where OT exists, how it impacts us, and we've reviewed some quote unquote fun cyber attacks that have occurred over the past 10 years, I'm sure you're probably wondering how do we define what systems are OT? Well, let's run through uh, several system components here so you can get an understanding of what is fundamentally found in manufacturing environments. But before we can do that, we really need to learn about the Purdue model, which is co the commonly known as the Purdue model, but it is known the Purdue Enterprise Reference Architecture, or PARA. It was first created in the early 90s by Theodore Williams. And the purpose of the model was to define the crucial infrastructure used in production. When it was cor correctly implemented, it would achieve the air gap between IT and OT systems. The air, the air gap if you don't know, is the physical separation between the enterprise IT and the manufacturing OT landscape. The standard Purdue model contains six different levels here. So level five, typically used for enterprise devices. This is what you normally use to work on. Nothing significant here. We have level 3.5, which is known as the demilitarized zone. I always have a very difficult time pronouncing demilitarized, but I call it the DMZ, just like everyone else. Level three is typical manufacturing. It's, it's for management servers. Level two is control systems, which can be, be very easily found within a specific site. And level one and zero is for intelligent devices and for the physical processes, which could be uh, checking temperature or pressure, or flow. Now that we've reviewed the framework, Let's review some of the systems that we can find within the model of this, uh, within the Purdue model. So we've got the distributed control system, which is dedicated to systems manufacturing processes and is typically found within the chemical, water, and nuclear industries, but it can be found a lot more places than that. It is found in layers one or zero of the Purdue model to your left. Process control system is directly monitors and manages an industrial automation process and sensors are ingrained into this machine so it can check pressure flow and temperature like i mentioned earlier it can be found basically everywhere else and it does reside in layer two or three the difference here is if it has a single process that it's monitoring it's going to be in layer two but if it is monitoring multiple processes within a single site, it'll be in layer three because it's going for the management component. There is also the programmable logic controller, which is what the, uh, what, what it was the Triton worm modified. No, it was Stuxnet, sorry, too many attacks to have to remember. It was Stuxnet, that virus was what um, made the PLC uh, burn out the centrifuges because the program was altered maliciously. You can find the PLCs particularly within steel, automotive, and chemical, and it resides in layers one or two. And we've got field devices. These contain the sensors, so you can do temperature, check humidity, and actuators, which will actually implement the change within the manufacturing process. And there are two different types of devices here. We have basic and smart. We'll focus on the smart because they are most closely related to the industrial IoT component. They can be found everywhere. And they are typically reside in layers two, one, or zero. Like I mentioned earlier, I told you I'd go over the SIS. It is the system that directly monitors for specific conditions and acts to maintain safety component within the manufacturing environment. We need to make sure that all of the employees remain safe. OSHA is not okay with this if it goes or deviates from any sort of safe nature. This is a system that's critical to that. The role of the SIS is to reduce the risk by implementing safety instrumented functions. They are very commonly found in high risk work environments, nuclear, refineries, chemical, anything you name it. And they can be found in two, one, or zero of the Purdue model. Then we have building automation system, which is one of my favorites. Uh, people interact with this a lot more than they think they, can, they do. 
because of uh, building security, you have building safety measures, fire, water, air conditioning. Uh, let's be honest, you even have operational technology or a control system within your own home if you have air conditioning, which I really hope you do since it's July and most places are probably very warm right now. So with that in mind, this kind of technology at industrial scale lies in levels two, one, or zero. Since we've run through several common ICS OT components, I'm gonna go through some of the differences between IT and OT. At the heart of it all, the systems have different goals and priorities. Keep in mind that the three priorities listed for each of the technology here is by no means all inclusive, but does capture a high level overview of the technology. But I mentioned earlier, safety, top of mind for ICS OT. Think back to the Triton attack, where the safety instrumentation system included the unexpected shutdown. If this hadn't been completed safely, this could have put employees in real danger. Then we have availability. Let's circle back to our previous COVID example. If any part of the development, manufacturing, and distribution of the vaccine is halted because of a cyber attack, lives could be at stake. Not everything is life or death in ICS OT, but if you think about it, a large percentage of the systems could have an impact on our livelihood. A previous example that we discussed related to availability is the remote heart surgery machine. What happens if that machine isn't available to perform the surgery or quits midway through? And then reliability. Reliability and think about the cost implications that occur when businesses and production plants are brought down. Time is money, so any disruption to the manufacturing process is inexcusable. A prime example of this is the Colonial Pipeline hack that occurred in late April of this year. The attack has since then been attributed to a criminal hacker group called Darkside with the intention of holding data at ransom or ransomware. The attack was fulfilled through a compromised password in a legacy VPN application that didn't have multi-factor authentication required. A ransom note was identified by a control room employee, which prompted the pipeline to be removed in order to contain the potential threat, which was still unknown at that time. This is a prime example of an indirect ICS OT attack because the infrastructure wasn't the target. It was the corporate data. Taking the pipeline offline had numerous consequences, some of which we're still feeling now. And not all of them were just in the Southeast, but that was where they were primarily felt. On Memorial Day weekend, the Southeast average cost of gasoline went up 21 cents. The national average went up eight cents. That's 50% more than usual on a Memorial Day weekend. Gas shortages were also reported. 57% of gas stations in North Carolina reported outages, while 85% in Washington, D.C. had no gas. Overall, 12,000 gas stations around the country with, went without fuel. Next up, IT. I have deliberately put these out of the typical order that most of us see, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, so the CIA triad. All of them together, I kind of like to look at it as a bar stool. Not one of them is more important than the other. I won't spend too much time here because I'm, I am assuming that a lot of us are already in the enterprise IT environment, so we all understand the importance of this, but integrity, is the involvement and maintenance of consistency and accuracy of data throughout its life cycle. Availability is when information should be consistent and readily accessible for authorized parties, because none of us like to go online shopping and realize that our website is down. Confidentiality measures are designed to prevent any unauthorized access attempts. So at a high level, ICS OT have very different priorities in mind. We, they do share the availability in mind, um, but one has a much higher risk implication than the other. So what are some common risks that are affiliated with operational technology? 
As I mentioned earlier, networks is a huge deal. This air gap, so the physical separation between IT and OT is monumental and is actually not done nearly as often as you would hope. Then there is the IT OT convergence. And this is when this is when IT and OT have to have real time communication, communication and data processing. This makes it difficult because the entire purpose of IT OT convergence and having uh, my personal cell phone be able to complete an OT manufacturing task with a certain amount of authentication, the, the network component between those two can be very difficult to obtain from different companies. And then we have the issue of remote access support in ICS OT. A lot of the vendor hardware has to be completed maintenance and support by the vendor themselves. Without this, contracts can be broken and it would and you will never get any support for those devices. So remote access is very huge within the network and it is a risk within OT as well. We also have assets. As I mentioned earlier, we have some networks where the line between IT and OT can be very blurred because of IIoT infrastructure. For example, in 2017, a smart coffee maker was put on the manufacturing environment unknowingly, of course. Uh, someone put the smart coffee maker onto the network. Uh, the factory engineer went in after the investigation and the manufacturing network went down. I would want coffee if I were having the day that he were having. He went into the coffee maker. He noticed that the same error that was found on his control system workstation was on the smart coffee maker. That was when they realized that whoever installed the smart coffee maker put it directly onto the manufacturing Wi-Fi network instead of enterprise. With all that being said, you can't protect what you don't know what's on your network. And then legacy requirements. ICS OT infrastructure is very commonly known for using legacy operating systems because of the applications that require it weren't built to be compatible with Windows 10. It might have been Windows XP is what they were built to be compatible with. The lifespan of hardware and software for this kind of infrastructure could be 10 to 20 years. In comparison, IT is maybe one to five years if we're lucky. This is a challenge because unsupported operating system applications and firmware is a huge threat to the network. There is plenty of information out there on the web on what devices are currently internet facing, what type of device that we're dealing with, and the vendor that supports it. What ports are even, and what ports are even open to that technology might even be able to be found online as well. And then patching, my favorite. Patching becomes a problem because of the previously mentioned legacy requirements. So we're dealing with all kinds of legacy operating systems and applications in the environments. The twist of this is that we can't just shut down like IT equipment and patch and test and update. Sometimes there has to be a 99.999% uptime for these devices, which almost entirely eliminates upgrade time. But the good news is ICS OT employees are recognizing this issue and they are establishing shutdowns and upgrades to complete. However, what happens if a zero day attack occurs? That's when security and manufacturing have to convene and determine what level of risk they're willing to undergo. Do they shut down the plant, update, test, restart, or do they go along their merry way knowing that that is vulnerable, but the likelihood of attack is very minimum. And with that in mind, we've got some steps that we can do in order to mitigate some of the risks previously identified. Identify your priorities. And this is where a company should ask themselves where would be the high the area where there would be a high impact or likelihood of occurrence 
It's recommended that you select priorities and map out their impact and select the likelihood of occurrence when doing with this. And assets, like I mentioned earlier, you can't protect what you don't know. Unfortunately, most of the time, asset identification is going to be a pain. You'll be able to maintain what you, once you have the inventory, though, you'll be able to create a process for adding, updating, and deleting the asset inventory. But a tricky thing is with the IT OT convergence, how do you delineate between IT and OT devices? So, knowing your audience is critical when doing this. You have to go up to different teams, be it IT, and determine what devices fall in scope of OT. So, I typically ask people, what tasks are completed on your device? What applications do you interface with on a daily basis? Do you know what network your device is connected to? And does your device interface with manufacturing or quality control labs? Some these are all examples of questions, varying experience levels that I ask users throughout a daily basis to determine if it's an IT or an OT device. Examples of important attributes you should have within your asset inventory are operating system and version, asset owner, hardware information, and company unique ID. So you got to prioritize your control areas here, whether this be remote access, like I mentioned earlier, so that you can have a safe way for your vendors to maintain and support your software, endpoint security, or network segmentation. You have to prioritize these and capture the criticality and should impact, which will impact the product or service for your company the most. Uh, this is my favorite one. <laughs> Connecting the right people is a lot harder than anyone would ever think it should be. Uh, keeping executives and directors in mind is very important, obviously, because they are the ones that gives us the budget and resources that we need to get our day done. However, they aren't the folks that are getting everything done on the daily basis. We need different management brought in and brought in and getting us in to the teams that we really need to be connected with. We need the right people in IT automation, and engineering, and we need them to work alongside each other. This management team needs to be very focused on getting the right people from their teams involved. The right people from their teams that should be involved are specialty engineers, and like we mentioned earlier, 58% of companies are having issues finding people with security and manufacturing experience. But these folks will be the ones actually responsible for completing the work throughout the day. And investigation. Use the asset inventory that you created and procured to connect with your network staff and start mapping out your network. I highly suggest using the, the Purdue model and acclimating that to your personal network where you need to. Identify the gaps. You've connected with leadership, management, all kinds of people at this point, I am sure that you have identified gaps where either you're communicating not enough or the devices, you're not sure who the device owners are for some of them. There's a whole number of issues that could go wrong. But once you connect with the people, you'll be able to identify that much easier. Just keep in mind that you should keep everything written down so you can let your management and executive team know later on. And then processes. Once you've been going through this, you'll probably see some similarities and you'll be able to see exactly how different IT, OT processes might be. In my opinion, patching processes can be very similar with role responsibility, but the overall completion of the process can be very different. You can't just patch and restart whenever you want, like I mentioned earlier. But access control can be very, very similar. Security monitoring and asset management are all very similar processes between IT and OT. So determine which ones that you can keep and which ones might need to be slightly altered. Yeah, analyze the vulnerabilities that are currently in your landscape at this point, which is easier said than done. Uh, you also need to prioritize which one of these, and I highly recommend using the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, or CVSS, which can help you identify and prioritize which vulnerabilities need to be fixed first. 
there is a caveat. Some companies do have the ability, well, they do have a slight variation to the CVSS scoring throughout. So just keep that in mind as you're working. There might be some machines that are also going to be excluded from the vulnerability management process. Keep a log, get a risk owner involved, and make sure that mitigation strategies are created in order for these devices to do as little harm if possibly exploited. And then governance component, which is uh, always fun. Standardizing all of these controls and processes is a huge undertaking. And it, it's going to be rough, long, short term. But long term, it's going to be better for everyone to get all of the grunt work completed. An important thing is the leadership and management teams need to understand how much time, work, and collaboration between these teams needs to occur. As I mentioned in the connection phase, getting the right people involved can take weeks, sometimes even months, especially during vacation season like it is now. You never know. A communication strategy should definitely be implemented to make sure that you're talking to the leadership, management, and the engineers within the, well, in a good amount of time. You don't want to over-communicate or under-communicate. It's just going to be a work in progress. And with that in mind, we do have auditing component as well, which I know everyone is super thrilled about. You should have, if you have an internal auditing component, you should definitely use that. If you do not, however, I would highly recommend getting a third party to come in and assess to make sure that there is no bias that is seeping in throughout the auditing process. So I have given you an immense amount of information and with that in mind, I've listed out a few governance items here that you can use and keep in mind with the resources of ICSOT. It can be really hard to figure out where to start, so I would highly recommend signing up for the newsletters within the governance section provided. You can get vulnerability alerts, threat landscape overviews, conference information, and general governance updates. With the numerous resources, there's always the ability to have continuous improvement. I am by no means an expert in ICS OT. Like I mentioned, it's been around for decades and I am in the under three year mark. So I am currently completing an online SANS course and working to get certified by the end of the year in operational technology security. And with the fast paced environment where we're at, we have to keep in touch with everything and continuous improvement and learning is just a given. For your personal journey, if I have sparked your interest at all, which is a big if, we'll see, uh, I would highly recommend joining an IT professionals group. I coincidentally found a meetup group. It was global for ICS OT, which linked me to a chapter within my community as well. I'd highly recommend that. I even found an IT community on Nextdoor the other day, which is just thrilling. I never thought my neighbors would be interested in such a thing. Uh, there's Coursera and Udemy. I noticed that they both have free and for sale learning uh, for ICS OT. So I'd, I'll also highly recommend that as well. And with that, I will open it up to questions. I have not been able to look at the comments bar because of my technological incompetence in some places. So Kat, do I have any questions currently? Um, so far, by the way, great talk. I've been commenting a little bit, but also writing down notes because I do IOT yeah. um, talks and you've given me a lot of things to add to mine and, and Good. wake up and, um, I, governance in an ICS world? Are you kidding me? <laughs> um, the fact that you just mentioned meetup and I'm going, wait, meetup is still a thing? It is still a thing, yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, okay, I'm going to have to look at, I, I, I actually run a, ran a bunch of meetups. I was the organizer. I wonder if I'm yeah. still there. Scary. Um, no, this was a really great talk. I'm still looking to Good. see no yeah. questions. I am going to post. Yeah. This is the survey link, everyone. Absolutely. Um, please take just a couple minutes. It won't take that long at all. 
to fill out the survey. As a speaker myself, I know that speakers don't get enough feedback on their talks, especially the positive feedback. Sure, people take the time when they don't like a talk to go and say, oh, I didn't like the talk. But especially if you like the talk, go and fill out the, the survey um, and let Megan know what a great job she did. Um, yeah, still no questions. So I think you did okay. such an amazing job that you just kind of left everybody going, Whoa, my explode. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I have a few opportunities to connect. I am one of the security professionals with a tinfoil hat, so I am not on Snapchat, Twitter, or Instagram or anything like that. But if you do happen to have questions, um, hit me up on LinkedIn or I have my email on the presentation as well. So. Okay, we did get a couple questions. Let's see. Keeping an inventory seems impossible. I know you touched on it. Any more tips on keeping an inventory? So there are actually multiple tools out there right now. I highly recommend doing a proof of concept with some of the tools. Uh, you can get network tools like um, I know of one, uh, Armus. And it directly takes all of your assets that with that are within the network VLAN where you implement it. So it'll take all of the traffic and assets via there. Uh, but at this point, the best thing I can give to you is to try out one of the tools, reach out to a vendor, and see what you can start gathering without having to contact some of the people at sites. Once you get into various manufacturing sites, you get into spreadsheets and it can get ugly real fast. <laughs> hey, really quick, could you put your LinkedIn um, ID in the in the chat? Yeah, there? absolutely. Yeah, let me do that. Um, we did get another question. Is creating or using air-gapped networks still done and considered safe? Ooh. Um. It is still done. So the Purdue model is definitely the, the better reference here. Um, there is DMZ. You, there's a way that you can proxy traffic and, and segment networks. But like I mentioned, the ITOT uh, convergence has made it incredibly difficult. So the easiest route is to make devices separate for IT and OT keeping the networks and having completely separate networks, not even I'm talking separate VLANs. I am saying absolutely separated. So it is possible. Like I said, I am also three years into it. I am talking to industry professionals and still learning on an hourly basis. So I encourage you. I've got a lot of links in this presentation to do your own research, but absolutely it's possible. It's just going to be, there's going to be a little hell to pay. <laughs> um, will you be posting your slides? Yes, I actually, I can't. Is there a, a preferable method? I think I posted it on schedule, but that was probably just for speakers. If it is, no, if it's on sched, um, sched then yeah. people should be able to get to it. Um, let it is me on, but confirm quick. with me, you know, I've, Six month old. Sometimes mommy brain kicks in. <laughs> um, I'm looking. I'm looking. I see it. The PDF is there. So Good. if you go to Sked and find "Protecting the Source of Our Spark" by Megan Dewitt, you will find at the bottom the PDF of the presentation, and that will have uh, all of her information. Yep. Great. Just posted the LinkedIn URL as well. So awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's funny. My LinkedIn is all about my photography. It doesn't say anything about computer <laughs> security. And people always yeah. go, wait a minute. What? You know, <laughs> I'm you. pretty bad at social media, to be honest. I keep trying to get into Twitter and doing that security yeah, ninja stuff on. and you ooh. gotta get on twitter you gotta get on twitter you have a lot I, of good stuff to share i think i'm 60 at heart so i have a hard time <laughs> hey wait a minute um i'm not even gonna comment on that one cool. okay <laughs> but but remember tequila alcohol is a preservative so cheers to everybody yes this was a great session 
Um, we do have one more session following this. It is in stage one. Um, the link was posted in the in the chat. This is our closing keynote, which I announced earlier, and I was off by an hour. Um, thank you again, Megan, for doing a great job thank today. You. And cheers. Thanks, everyone.